Paul the rabbi and Paul the Greek philosopher. And Paul tells us this in verse 19. For though I am free from all men, I have made myself a slave to all, <coughs> that I might win the more. To the Jews, I became as a Jew, that I might win Jews. To those who are under the law, as under the law, though not being myself under the law, that I might win those who are under the law. To those who are without law, as without law, though not being without the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those who are without law. Now, this is not an endorsement of antinomianism. What Paul was saying in this verse very briefly is, when you drive from Britain to Scotland, some of the laws between Eng I'm sorry, England and Scotland, in England and Scotland, some of the laws will be the same, some will be different. But when you drive across from Cumbria into Scotland, You've passed from the juridical authority and the jurisdiction of England into the jurisdiction of Scotland. Some laws will be the same, some will be different, but you're not without law. Well, when you get saved, you go out from the law of Moses, law of sin and death, under the law of Christ, but you're not without law. Some things in the Old Testament are the same <coughs> as those who are in the New Testament. Some are different. But Christians are not without law. We're under the law of Christ. You've come out of one law and gone under another. People who are always yelling legalism and this kind of stuff every time you point to the Bible, they are lawless. They are antinomian. And this relates to what the Bible calls the spirit of lawlessness. And Jesus said because of lawlessness, most men's love will grow cold. We explain this on the uh, caveats of the Olivet Discourse tape. Nonetheless, let's continue reading what he says here. For the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. In verse 22, I've become all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. I do all things for the sake of the gospel, that I might become a fellow partaker of it. Do you not know that those who run in all, who run in a race, all run, but only one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may win. Everyone who competes in the games exercises self-control in all things. Now, the fruit of the Spirit is self-control. Peter, Peter speaks of self-control, the Greek word ikrete. When you see a lack of self-control, you are seeing an absence of God's Spirit being in control. When you see people falling on the floor in, in hysterics and vibrating in drunkenness, that tells you it is not the Spirit of Jesus. The fruit of the Spirit of Jesus is always self-control. When you see a lack of self-control in Galatians, we're told that tells you Christ is not in something. Christ is not in Toronto or Pensacola or these things. He's not in Lack of self-control means God's not in control. Paul reiterates this various places, but let's continue. Therefore, I run in such a way as not without aim. I box in such a way as not beating the air. But I buffet my body and make it my slave, lest possibly after I have preached to others, I myself should be disqualified. What a terrible thing that is if someone doesn't control their own flesh, even though they may preach the true gospel and even see people get saved. But that's another issue. Our purpose today is Paul the rabbi and Paul the philosopher. On our tapes on 1 Corinthians, two-part tapes, Koinonia, which we did for the first time ever, I think, here in Normandy. Of course, there's a polished-up version of it now. Is uh, Koinonia, the New Testament concept of fellowship. According to the first Corinthians. Paul was taking concepts known to the Hebrews, we point out on that tape, and trying to culturally repackage the same things for the Greek world, for the Greco Roman world. Okay? Now, the book of Acts gives us the history of the early church from one aspect only. It shows us how Christianity went via Asia Minor into Europe, into the Western world, into the Greco-Roman world. That's all. We know that Christianity went to black Africa, 
before it went anywhere else, the Ethiopian eunuch. First, the first non-Jew to respond to the, I'm not counting the Samaritans, who were semi-Jews, the first non-Jew, ethnic, ethnic non-Jew to respond to the gospel, was a black African. The first person Jesus saved was not Jewish, was a black African, the Ethiopian eunuch. In fact, the Hebrew word for a black African and an Ethiopian is the same word in Hebrew, Kushi, the land of Kush, Kushites. And we know the gospel prospered in Africa, in black Africa. We know from history and archaeology that the gospel prospered across the entire north of Africa. The Berber people were entirely Christian until the Muslims invaded their nations and took their land. You know, the Muslims are always crying about <laughs> Israel. Israel has already returned effectively 97% of the land conquered in the Six-Day War. If you count what they've given back under Camp David and so on, they've already returned 97% of the land. And they're crying the over the other 3%. <laughs> it's absolutely. What have they given up? Nothing. Yeah, nothing. Yeah, that's Islam. But what the Muslims won't tell you is how they invaded North Africa. And to this day, Berbers are second-rate citizens in Algeria and Tunisia and Morocco. Can't even have their own language or their own culture. The ancient Berbers were Christians who were, either, who were murdered if they didn't become Muslims. And the other ones were forced to confess Islam at the point of a sword. The land is immorally and, I would say, unlawfully occupied by the Arabs to this day. If you want to be, use Islamic principles, if you want to use the same principles they're trying to use about Israel, you'd have to say that, well, by the same standard, they should leave Morocco, they should leave Algeria. Of course, you can say they've been there all these centuries, uh, what, the, what the Americans did to the Indians and so on, okay, the Red Indians, or, or they've been here so long, now they're indigenous, you can make that argument. But that doesn't give you any right to repress <laughs> the natives. And that's what they do. Okay. The gospel spread very quickly across the North Africa as well as Black Africa. We know that the gospel spread to the East. Historical tradition tells us Thomas went as far as India. But also, we know that the Armenian Empire embraced Christianity long before the Roman Empire. The first empire to Christianize was the Armenians, not the Romans. Why does the book of Acts only give us one direction where Christianity spread? <clears throat> begins in Israel for everybody. Okay. Begins in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. But why does the book of Acts only trace the historical record one way? Only the expression of Christianity that became Hellenized. Why? That's very simple. That was the hardest path the gospel had to take, was the Western world. The African received the gospel easily. The North African received it easily. The Oriental people received it easily. It was the Hellenized Europeans, the white people, who didn't. It was the hardest path. <laughs> the Orientals received it. The blacks received it. <laughs> it was the Western, the European, who received it. It shows the hardest path. If you know the hardest path, if you know the hardest mission field, <laughs> and you have no problem with the easy ones, right? If you can play acoustic guitar, it's no problem with an electric one, right? Don't the pluck is hard. So it is. Paul is trying to take concepts known by the Jews and give them to the Greeks. And you begin with two different worldviews. Somebody has asked me about this today, coincidentally, at least a question related to it, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Indeed, Jews ask for a sign, Greeks search for wisdom. In a nutshell, it's this. The Hebrew way of thinking says, first believe, trust by faith, then you will understand. But not exactly. What it really said was, God has already given us enough reason to trust him. So based on what he has done, we should believe and trust him further. We don't trust him blindly. We don't have a blind faith. He gave them holidays to remember what he did for them. Remember the Passover? And he kept, he, for centuries, God identified himself to the Hebrews. I am the Lord your God who took you out of Egypt. In other words, remember what I did for you. You have enough reason to trust me now. That wasn't a blind faith, but it was a faith that said, based on what he's already done, 
Just trust him and believe him, then you will understand further. But the Greeks did not have the revelation of the true God yet. The Greeks sought wisdom. So the Greeks said, first let me understand, then I'll believe. You understand? Because the Hebrews had the monotheistic revelation of the one true God, it was, trust me, then you'll understand. You already have enough reason to trust me. Believe, then you'll understand. The Greeks didn't have that revelation. It for them became, first let me understand, then I'll believe. Paul had to cross this divide into the Aristotelian and Platonic world. There were certain concepts that the pagans had no concept of whatsoever. None. One was what in modern terms came to be known as abolitionism. Freeing slaves. They had a provision where somebody had the option of giving freedom to a slave in exchange for certain things. But the idea of abolishing the institution was unknown in the non-Jewish world. Under the Torah, God did not allow slavery. It was outlawed. A man stealer, somebody who abducted somebody to put them into slavery had to be capitally executed. Okay. That was very strange that the Calvinists who perpetrated slavery in the American South were replacementists who believed the church was the new Israel. Well, if they were going to do that, they should have followed the Torah and hung the people selling them slaves who were abducting them <laughs> and hung the, hung the African chiefs who were selling their own people. That's what they should have done. <laughs> they, they were going to keep the Torah. They should have hung the man. They should have killed the man stealers. But, but they just took the aspects that suited their economic interest. <laughs> The Jews would not allow slavery. At the year, they allowed what, again, in modern terms, we call what came to be known in the 18th century as indenturism. Or what the Bible calls bond, servant, bond servanthood or bond servantship. Bond servants. The person would be legally bound to you until the Hashanah Hayovel, the year of Jubilee. They had to go free. You couldn't keep somebody a slave. Once he paid what he owed, once he did it, he was free. Now he had the option of bonding himself. At Passover time, this time of year, take a gold nail and drive it through the ear of his door and a ritual into the doorpost. If he worked for somebody who was benevolent and who took good care of him and his family, who was a righteous man according to the Torah, and this person was a person of affluence and means and gave him a better livelihood for himself and his family than he could likely earn himself, he had the option of remaining in that person's servanthood by his own choice. But he could not be legally forced to do it. At the year of Jubilee, they had to go free. Even among non-Jews, if those non-Jews became monotheists and underwent conversion to Judaism, they couldn't be kept as slaves. Year of Jubilee, they walked, that's it. When people didn't do this, when people refused to set the slaves free, like you read in the book of Amos, God became angry. He said, this is not simply a sin against them, it is a sin against me. These are my people, I set them free. A concept which Paul picks up on in the New Testament. And the Lord is neither free nor slave, we're all free men of the Lord. So the prophet Amos begins to preach abolitionism. Which of course in this country with the Wesleys and with William Wilberforce and the Earl of Shaftesbury and then the later the abolitionists in the United States they took their inspiration from these books. 
Remember, the first countries to abolish slavery were Christian. The last ones to abolish slavery are Muslim. And I just heard news reports yesterday that there's a slave ship with little black kids on it being sold as slaves in Africa. You know, to this day, rich Muslims buy black children as slaves. Only place in the world you find slavery, and it's blacks being enslaved still by Muslims. Yet the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan goes around and tells people Christianity is a white man's religion. Islam is the religion of black liberation. Yeah, tell it for those kids in a slave ship that we heard on the news yesterday. Go tell them that. See what they tell you, Mr. Farrakhan. Abolitionism was a concept the Jews knew. Not the, not the Gentiles. Now, Paul was in a situation where if Paul began preaching against slavery the way Amos did, okay, and saying it was sin and immoral and unjust and all this, and an offense against God, the church would have been accused of sedition and even more persecuted. So what Paul did was to make it clear that within the church, slavery was not God's ideal, and it should ideally be gotten rid of. He says if you're a slave and you can get free, do that. What Paul said. Okay. And Paul told Christian, and if slaves had been free, <coughs> they would have had no economic means of survival. So Paul told Christians who had slaves that didn't want to go free or couldn't go free just for reasons of survival, that you treat them as your equal. Now these concepts were radical to the Greek world. So what Paul was saying is, look, as the gospel permeates the Greco-Roman world, slavery will disappear of itself. Okay? He wanted to get rid of it, but he knew if he tried to get rid of it, then he would have been accused of sedition. It would have been seen as economically undermining the economy of the Roman Empire. 25% of the population in most of the cities alone were slaves. And in the rural communities, on the farms and that, it was higher. Imagine the social and political upheaval that would have resulted and the persecution that would have come on the church. And the Romans, you know, if the slaves began talking about being free, the Romans, they would have just kill them. <laughs> they would be no to talk about anything. Else. Okay. These were concepts of which the non-Jewish world had no concept. So Paul has to introduce these things progressively. A similar concept was monogamy. Even by Jesus' day, most Jews only had one wife. And Jesus himself said, look, from the beginning it was not so. Okay. Even by the Second Temple period, there was a lot more monogamy. So what Paul says is the same thing. Well, this is negative. But if you Greek people already have more than one wife, keep her. Except you cannot be a leader or a deacon or an elder in the church. You can't have any leadership position in ministry in the church if you have more than one wife. So he does what he does with slavery. He demeans it. He says it's not God's ideal, and, it's, and we, we have to get rid of it in the church. And then once we get rid of it in the church... We have to, as the gospel progresses, we have to look to get rid of it in society. Okay? Polygamy. And of course the Mormons go back under this, don't they? These were concepts of which the pagan world had virtually little or no concept. With these things, Paul is progressive in his strategy. However, there were other things in which Paul's day resembles our day. There was a counterfeit spirituality. That counterfeit spirituality is like all counterfeit spirituality, including ours. Truth is mixed with error. Now, we have other tapes explaining this. The Greek words, akathasis, and the, 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 the Greek word, uh, 
Paras Dov Zustin, we have other tapes explaining it. Things that are somehow true, but perverted or distorted. Let's look at these things. There were things that the Greeks and Romans and so on knew about, but they had a wrong slant on that became demonically influenced. To this day, you will find the non-Western world, the Orient and Africa, will have the same advantages and disadvantages they had in the early church. The advantages you'll find in bringing the gospel to Asia or Africa is they're much more spiritually aware because they didn't have the enlightenment. <laughs> you don't have to try to convince an Asian or African that there's evil spirits, demons. They know that. You don't have to try to convince them there's supernatural power. They know that. You don't have to try to convince them that there's some kind of afterlife or, or immortality of the soul. They know that. They're not corrupted by Western rationalism. On the other hand, because they never had the Enlightenment, they are corrupted by something else, superstition. <laughs> That's the disadvantage. <laughs> okay? That's the disadvantage. The Westerner, it's the opposite. People who live in the West, irrespective of their color or race, they may not be superstitious. Okay. But they have a perverted rationalism which they think is logical, but is really blindness. Now, in the new spirituality, we have to understand something. 25 years ago, 35 years ago, even when I was in university, the obstacle was rationalism. It was atheism. It was, I was an agnostic. Okay? It was Western Rash. That was the obstacle. Now society is no longer, they'll no longer say religious belief is superstitious. Instead, they will be into the occult superstition. As Asia and Africa progresses, begins to industrialize, those quarters at least begin to emerge away from superstition while people in the West are going back into it. They're reading horoscopes, they're reading books on the occult. They'd... Additionally, much of what is called self-help, psychology, has as much to do with the occult as it does science. We deal with this on the first Thessalonians tape. So we are up against a situation similar to what Paul was up against. I pointed out a number of times when you witness to New Age people. I, I witnessed to New Ages in Hawaii. That's one of the places they go. The place they go to in Britain is this Finhorn place in Scotland. That's where they hang out. To go to Hawaii and you see Western people, people university educated. I mean dentists and engineers and accountants, people in their 20s and 30s men and women with careers and professions standing on the beach naked with tattoos chanting at the sun. Hundreds of them pounding on drums chanting at the sun naked dancing on the beach. And of course you try to witness to them. <laughs> and it's strange. You tell them you believe in Jesus. Of course they also believe in Jesus. That's the cosmic Christ. You tell them you believe in sin. Of course, they believe in sin. That's giving place to negative energy. That's being negative. <laughs> you tell them you believe in the Holy Spirit. They, of course, believe in the Holy Spirit, what a philosopher would call the zeitgeist, the spirit of the age. You tell them you saw the light and you were born again. I saw the light and I was born again. They will tell you that they saw the light and they were born again. They came to the 
awareness of the cosmic illumination of the inner self. <laughs> I was down at beach in Hawaii several months ago, and this guy tries to sell me some cannabis. And I try to witness to him. That guy could quote whole passages from the book of Revelation. I wish most saved Christians knew as much scripture as he did. Except that he had this new age interpretation of it. John was smoking reefer when he had these visions or something like that. <laughs> now, having been a hippie in the 60s and that, I know what this is. I used to take acid and all that when I was a kid. I knew what, I know, I understand what the, we, my generation began this stuff. I know what, what it was. We did the whole thing with the skinny dipping and smoking reefer on the beach. We did, we invented that stuff. But there's a problem. They use the same terms as we, any form of Gnosticism uses the same terms you do, but it means something by it. We've explained this in other tapes. But they have a hold of a truth that has been demonically subverted and corrupted and distorted. They have a demonically subverted, corrupted, distorted interpretation of a truth that will parallel much of what you and I believe and what the Word of God actually teaches to be truth. It'll superficially parallel it. It will have much similarity, in essence, but also a fundamental deviation, which is, of course, demonic. We have to understand that Paul wrote these things, not just for his time. The Word of God is for all time, especially for the last days. In fact, I think the argument could be made the Word of God is even more relevant for the last days than it was for the day it was written, or at least as relevant. Of course, the devil has raised up liars and deceivers who teach against this. The main liar of Satan today in the church is Tommy Tenney, who wrote the book God Chasers. He says the Bible is just the old truth. That's where God has been. We have to go where he is now. He's, of course, all the big talk now. He's Paul Weaver, the, the, the so-called general superintendent of the Assemblies of God, has Tenney as the speaker this year, the featured speaker at the Assemblies of God conference, together with Gerald Coates and Colin Dye. Penny's the latest one, the man of the means, the word of God. Thus the old truth is what God used to be. That's, that's the devil's servant Tommy Tenney and the devil's servant Paul Weaver. Another one is Clark Pinnock. Another one of Satan's agents today is Clark Pinnock. Now uh, endorsed by the Church of Nazarene, apparently. At least they had him lecturing in their Bible college. Very disappointing. Uh, he, you know, the future depends on us, not on God. He doesn't know the future. The outcome is determined by us. Unbelievable. <clears throat> the God within puts us in the place of God. That's what New Age does. No. Every one of these agents, you'll find them now demeaning the relevance of the Word of God. First, they begin ignoring the exposition of Scripture. When you see the exposition of Scripture being ignored, as John Wesley said, look out. That's the first sign of death. It means they stop believing it. Then you had General Coates with that interview in South Africa where he says, he talks about the insufficiency of Scripture. <laughs> General Coates, the insufficiency of the Word of God. Now they got Clark Pinnock, and they got, then, then, then they get Tommy Tenney. It gets worse and worse and worse. This is the whole paradigm shift. Experience becomes the thing. There was this one guy who wrote a book called Marketing the Church where he tries to, he reduces, he's obviously influenced by people like Peter Wagner and Bill Hybels. I think his name is Barner. I, I have the book, and he wrote the book, and he says, the congregation is paramount. It's what the assembly, the congregation wants that's paramount. <laughs> not what God wants, not what God says. It's marketing. You find out what the market demand is, and you give it to them. This is the whole thing that Bill Hybels got from Robert Schuller. It's all what it is. Big lie of the devil. But in order for these ideas to be prevalent in the church, you have to go away from the word of God. And you have to have backslidden and false leaders like Paul Weaver and Gerald Coates that will bring this stuff in. You see. Then these guys like Tenney can take the church away. And that's what's happening. The schisms in the body between those who believe the word of God and those who effectively abandon it in favor of experience. 
And of course, this is the history of the charismatic movement. Experience replaces the word of God. The late heretic John Wimber, we're cataloging our experiences in order to work out what our doctrine is. <laughs> you don't begin with the word of God to find it. You begin to catalog your experiences. The whole paradigm shift. That is what we are up against, but that is what Paul was up against. Conflicting worldviews. Whenever you have a fundamental change in society, economically and politically and culturally, you have a change in worldview. The high-tech economy is the biggest change that has happened since the Industrial Revolution. There is a new worldview. People look at things differently than they did in the Industrial Age. In the old worldview, and the Industrial Revolution took 250 years to happen. The high-tech revolution took 25 years to happen. <laughs> Ten times faster. And it's still happening. In the old worldview, it was Western rationalism. And what came from it? Things like higher criticism. Those were the obstacles to the gospel. The new worldview, the new society, is no longer post-Christian. That was the old worldview. Now it is post-Christian neo-pagan. There is a new spirituality. Okay? We deal with this on the Show Me tape and teaching, which you can get in print inside a bit. This new spirituality is just like Corinth, essentially. They have a lot of the beliefs we have, superficially. And they even call them the same things. But they're really different. Let's see what Paul does. Paul tries to take things that they misunderstood. You see, every one of Satan's lies are not out and out lies. They're corruption of truths. Toronto, Pensacola, pioneers, pioneer and new frontiers, uh, these things, it exists, these things are counterfeits of biblical Pentecostalism, <laughs> of biblical charismata. Every one of Satan's lies are counterfeits of something true. Let's begin and see what some of these things are and what Paul the rabbi does. Chapter 2, verse 14. The Greeks believed in dualism. Dualism is a corruption of a truth. The truth being the old nature and the new. <laughs> the Bible never separates between the spiritual and the secular. The Bible only draws a distinction between things which will matter eternally and things which only matter temporarily. The scripture distinguishes between the temporal and the eternal, not the spiritual and the secular. So in the dualism of the Greeks, and you got to understand, later German philosophers like Kant basically re-innovated these same concepts with the a priori and all this stuff in different ways, but that's another story. This got into the church. Well, it doesn't matter. The new creation can't sin. I can go out and get drunk and fornicate because that's only the flesh, only the spirit matters. <laughs> you understand? Now, in the Greek thinking, that was it. You could be right with the gods, with Zeus and all this stuff, even though you were living licentiously. In fact, you could even find religious ways to justify it. Well, they had a concept about two natures. But the concept of two natures was perverted. Paul takes the right concept of two natures and explains it to the Greeks who had a wrong concept of two natures. You understand? Now, Paul in, in 2 Corinthians especially was up against false teachers, false apostles, who are coming in to corrupt what he taught that was true. 
Look at verse 14. A natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. He cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. That word appraised there in Greek is discerned. But he who is spiritual appraises all things, yet he himself is appraised by no man. Now, the liars would come in in 2 Corinthians and try to corrupt the things that Paul straightened out in 1 Corinthians. You understand? So after he wrote the first letter, these other guys came in and began corrupting, re-corrupting the things he came to straighten out. And now you see the same today. Rodney Howard Brown, on his vi uh, one of his videos, he says, don't try to understand this. The natural mind does not understand the things of the Spirit. Notice he changes one word. The Bible doesn't say the natural mind. It says the natural man. <laughs> The natural man is unsaved people. <laughs> we, we have the mind of Christ. He, gives the, he changes one word and gives the passage an entirely different meaning. In fact, the spiritual man in the very next verse judges all things. He tries to understand it on the basis of the word of God. It's the carnal man who does it. But that liar from hell, John Arnott, on one of his tapes, he says, don't try to understand the river, just jump in it. He's a liar from hell. The spiritual man will judge and discern all things. John Arnott is a liar from hell. If you are spiritual, you will judge it. He's the same ones in 2 Corinthians that came to corrupt what Paul straightened out in 1 Corinthians. What are they doing? New aging the church. Dualism. Let's continue. Let's look at chapter 7. The Greeks had a concept of sex and sexuality being a spiritual experience. They had the idea that sexual union was a spiritual as, and as well as an emotional and physical experience, that it was some path to something spiritual. That was their view. Only to them, it was the... This is the best of it. Hydros Damos. In Greek... The temple prostitutes. Now, this was the more relatively civil version of it. There were homosexual versions of it. Bisexuality was widespread. We deal with this on the First Corinthians tape and on the Preparing for Persecution tape. How the bisexuality that was socially normative in the first century church would become socially normative in the last century church. We deal with that on the Preparing for Persecution tapes. But they also get into bestiality where you'd have sexual union with animals as a way to... Different gods represent the different animals. You see this even hieroglyphics. And so guess what they would do to reach the gods? Not a pleasant subject. Either is this, but this was at least... If not palatable, at least addressable. They believed through sexual union with these temple prostitutes that they would have some kind of union with the divine. Now, this is a perversion of a truth. So Paul talks about, know ye not your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. If you sleep with a hooker, you're defending against your own body. The truth is, your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and your wife's body is a temple of the Holy Spirit, and God uses holy matrimony to draw two people closer to each other as a way of drawing them both closer to himself. As we deal with on the, some of our other tapes, the theology of matrimony is God makes man in his image and likeness and tells them to be one flesh, ahad. In Hebrew, the word ahad is plural oneness. The same as the Hebrew confession of faith. Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ahad. Hear, O Lord, hear, O Israel, the Lord of God is oneness. It's the same word for the union of Adam and Eve. In short, the Hebrew term in the Old Testament, you know this from our other tapes perhaps, you'll find sex, sexual intercourse in the Old Testament described as niknaspa, he went into her. One person goes inside of another person and a third person is procreated. It's one in three and three in one. It reflects the Trinity, reflects our maker. You understand? 
But then the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church in Corinthians chapter 5. As Israel was God's woman, the church is the bride of Christ. It's Jesus going inside of the church, causing the church to be fruitful. Yes, there is a theology of matrimony, and there is a spiritual dimension to sexual union within matrimony. And it does involve temple sex. <laughs> the Greeks understood there was a temple sexuality, but they had a corrupted, perverted concept of it. All of his lies corrupt something what's true. The devil can't invent anything. He can only corrupt something that God invented. He can't invent anything. He can only corrupt what God invented. God's the creator. Sex was God's idea. He invented it. Sex was God's idea. C.S. Lewis understood this in his screw tape letters. The devil doesn't like sex. He doesn't like anything that's pleasurable. If he can corrupt it and use it to get people away from God and from God's idea, well, he'll do that, but that's not his ideal. That's not what he wants. He doesn't like any pleasure. He'll just use these things to get people into sin, but that's all. Pleasure is, pleasure is God's idea. God invented pleasure. <laughs> that was God's idea. Sex was God's idea. For God's ideas. He just wants to, he wants to corrupt he wants to corrupt God's ideas. But making us think we can be our own gods. <sighs> okay. Bring us to the next point. Big problem in the first century church, particularly among the Romans. Deification. The Romans began to deify men, specifically the emperors. Now again, on the Matthew 16, 17 page, we explain this about the Pontificus Maximus, of whom Pope, the Pope is heir. Now the emperor was the head of the Pantheon, it's the Pontiff of Rome. The title bequeathed to the Roman Pope. They began deifying men, specifically emperors during their lifetime, and worshipping them. Okay. This suzerainty idea was that the monarch would be the son of the god. Okay? The Egyptians had their versions of it. They were all versions of it. And they would, they would address the monarchs as the son of this god or that god or whatever. Okay. Deification of men. This is a concept of the incarnation of Christ. To them, it was Zeus had relationships with, uh, had uh, sexual relations with a human woman, and the son was a, a mighty man, stronger than anybody else named Hercules. <laughs> that was their myth. Zeus came down from Mount Olympus, which is, of course, the counterfeit of Mount Zion. Harzion, Ariadeh, Sophona, Kiriat, Melechrav, Mount Zion, Mount Zion, the north, the city of the great king, and Zeus was going to come down to Mount Zion and uh, from Mount Olympus, and he's going to have relations with this human woman, and this super son is going to be born, he's going to deliver to people. <laughs> That's Hercules. <laughs> Understand. But what's that a counterfeit of? The Shekinah was on Mount Zion, the Holy Spirit. Jesus was conceived of the Holy Spirit inside of Mary, right? They had a concept that was somehow true. True enough to be believable, even true enough to appear compatible with the Bible. And you see this today, that's why you see YWAM telling people to go back into mosques and pagan temples, to the demonic. On the surface, it looks similar. I was once in a temple in Urfu in Egypt. You know what they had in that temple? An outer court, a holy place, and a holy of holies. One of the reasons you have so much, we deal with this on the golden calf tape, one of the reasons you have so much detail, one of the reasons in the Hebrew worship, is because the pagans had similar worship, similar temples, similar priesthood, and similar feast days. The Hebrew religion was to be the monotheistic polemic against the pagans who were thanking false gods for the harvest and the rain and all this stuff at the same days. But they had priesthoods, temples, everything looked the same. So you get down to the detail. It's the detail that makes the difference. Why can't Christians see this? You know, if you were to go through medical textbooks, you take a combination of symptoms. If swollen ankles, increased temperature, increased blood pressure, rashes on the extremities. So you got 20 symptoms. Those same 20 symptoms can be symptomatic of 500 different diseases and maladies that's only the known ones. 
Now, a diagnostician has to know not the similarities. He has to know what makes this one different. You've got to get into the detail. You've got to get into the blood chemistries. You've got to look at the... Well, we know what's the same. This has the same symptoms as this. It could be this, could be that, could be... This. You've got to look at what's the difference. And any credible theologian should know that. But they don't. You don't have theologians anymore. You have Paul Weavers and Gerald Coates. Give me a Martin Lloyd-Jones any day. One of the reasons he was a good preacher, perhaps, is that he was a good physician. He was a Queen's physician. <laughs> At least he knew how to think. These guys don't even think. I don't even know if they know how to think, some of them. Deification. Or, perhaps better put, <laughs> incarnation. God incarnate. Well, today you got the same stuff. You know, Mormonism, what Mormonism teaches about man and about God is the same thing as what Kenneth Copeland teaches. No difference virtually. Mormons, God was as man is. God was as man is. And as God is, man shall become. What does Copeland say? The same thing. Kenneth Copeland said he was born again, same as Jesus. Jesus was born again in hell after Satan got the victory on the cross. Kenneth Copeland says he could have died on the cross for our sins instead of Jesus Christ. Open blasphemy. Open heresy. Blasphemy. Worse than heresy. Blasphemy. Your, your God, we're all little God, the little God's thing. They take one verse in the scripture out of all context. We shall be as he is in his nature, but we shall never be him. He's the eternal God, and there's no other, he says. There's no God but me. Let's go further. It's no wonder they're getting closer to Mormons. They're going into ecumenical unity with Mormons because they believe what the Mormons believe. What else? Here's another one for the Mormons. Baptism. Turn to 1 Corinthians 15. The Jews had baptism. It was called Brit Mikvah. You see, the Essenes had baptism rituals. John the Baptist was baptizing people. But with a different concept than the New Testament one, which was co-death and co-resurrection. In the pre-Christian concepts of baptism, it symbolized washing your sin away. Or attempting to. In the biblical concept, the New Testament concept of baptism, rather, it wasn't getting rid of your sin, it was getting rid of the sinner. <laughs> you know, there's two different things entirely. Two different things entirely. God doesn't get rid of our sin, he gets rid of the sinner. Jesus took our sin. And get rid of our sin, he gets rid of the sinner. Become a new creation, cold death with Christ. Turn to, now the Mormons love this verse. 1 Corinthians 15, please. It's verse 29. Otherwise, what will those do who are baptized for the dead if the dead are not raised at all? Why then are they baptized for them? The Mormons knew about the afterlife. I'm sorry, the Mormons know, but also the Greeks knew about the afterlife, rather. Okay? So the Greeks were trying to be baptized on behalf of the dead. Paul here is talking about a pagan practice. He's saying, look, even the Greeks, even before you were saved, even when you were in paganism and superstition, you knew about the afterlife and about baptism. That's what he's, he's talking about a pagan practice. The Mormons think it's a Christian one. <laughs> Unbelievable. Paul is trying to give... The correct understanding. Okay. Now notice every one of these issues are issues today. Mormonism is the fastest growing so-called Christian sect in the UK. These things are practical for us. Although if it was just history, I, wouldn't buy, I would maybe do one tape of it and that would, it. would be it. This is for us. 
Same issues, simply repackaged for our time. More than that, charismata, gifts. The Greeks had prophecy. For them, it was the Delphic Oracle. You understand? <laughs> But today it's the same. They've got clairvoyance, they've got fortune tellers, people reading tarot cards, Ouija boards. People go have, in America, just phone in once. <laughs> on the TV, and you phone in and talk to them on there, they tell you this, that thing. Well, the Greeks knew about prophecy. And prophets, plenty. Tons of them. What was Paul saying? Was a counterfeit of something true? Paul is trying to give the right perspective. And one thing is this. Again, he's taking concepts known to the Jews and trying to give it to the Greeks. The prophet can't be wrong. Well, that makes the prophets of the ancient Greek gods false prophets. If it makes the prophets of Baal false prophets. If it made Hananiah a false prophet in Jeremiah 28. If it makes the Founders of Jehovah's Witnesses like Rutherford and Charles Tazzy Russell false prophets, and if it makes Joseph Smith a false prophet, it makes Rick Joyner, Gerald Coates, and Benny Hinn false prophets. Certainly Paul Cain. They're false prophets. Those who follow these men are in rebellion against God. They're following false prophets. They predict things that don't happen, then make another false prophecy. Paul tries to take this concept that the Jews would have known and give it to the Greeks. The Jews had some understanding. about God wanting to give his spirit and a new nature to people. They had some concept. Only in the Old Testament, okay, it was only, the Holy Spirit was only for certain people, high priests, kings, and prophets. Moses wanted all God's people to be able to prophesy sometime, but that was only possible under the New Testament, New Covenant. The Greeks knew about, the uh, Hebrews knew about the, uh, the, the theology of, of marital sexuality from the books of like Hosea. Right? Israel's, your, your husband is your maker. You know, Yahweh was, was the husband and Israel was his bride. And they had the Song of Solomon. They knew there was a theology to sex and, and marital sexuality. They knew about it. The incarnation, well, the Messiah was God to become a man. Baptism, the, the, the Jews had baptism, mikvah, and the Jews had prophecy. Only the Jews had the right views of these things. The Greeks had the wrong view. The Greeks had automatic speech. Glossolalia. Tongues. Which doctors have it? Mormons have it? Spiritists have it? They all have it. Always did. I believe in tongues, and I've prayed in tongues, but if you think that most of what passes for tongues today is tongues, you ought to have your head examined. <laughs> I'm not saying it's not a real. Most of what you hear today is not real. What does Paul do? He takes something the Jews were aware of. We're told in the rabbinic literature, it's only from Jewish history, that when the Shekinah was given, when the Torah was given, the Shekinah moved, and a whirlwind was heard from heaven, and based on the table of nations in Genesis 10, 70 languages were heard when the law was given. And of course, in the rabbinic counting, Hag Shavuot, the day of Pentecost, Christian day of Pentecost, the same day that the law was given is the same day the Holy Ghost was given to the church. Only one law. Law was given, 3,000 fell. When the Spirit was given, 3,000 were saved, remember? Grace under, uh, does the curse of the law. And the tongues were heard in both cases, according to Jewish history. And then the New Testament. Okay. Automatic speech. Isaiah 28 had a prophecy about tongues, we're told in 1 Corinthians. Jews had the right view of it. Greeks knew this stuff. They knew all this stuff. They knew all of this stuff. And more. 
a lot more. What Paul did was seek to correct things that the Greeks broadly knew about, but had a demonically subverted, distorted view of. Well, today in the new spirituality of the new age, people are no longer skeptics in the sense of 19th century German rationalism, which is where this stuff came from. You know, Bible colleges and theological seminaries are teaching people today how to answer questions nobody's answering. It's been often said quite rightly. They're still teaching people to fight yesterday's battles. The real battles today are not rationalism and higher criticism. It's new age and ecumenism. Those are the dangers of today. Those are Satan's instruments of today, ecumenism and new age. Again, the Greeks, they had a concept of resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, but it was a wrong one. What's reincarnation except a perverted idea of resurrection? That's all it is. A perverted one. Paul knew how to explain these things with in the cultural framework and within the linguistic framework of the people he was trying to talk to. Notice in chapter 9 where we began how he talks about Olympics. Now the Jews didn't like Olympics. That was one of the things that sparked off the rebellion of the Maccabees. Okay? These gymnasiums and these public athletic competitions where people would wrestle naked publicly in this stuff, this was an offense to the Jews. <laughs> Yet Paul knew how to take these same concepts that these Greeks were into. He'd, he'd go to where they were wrestling naked and say, look, you see what that guy's doing, punching up and these guys wrestling and everything like that. And he, he'd go there and take it to them. That's why I have no qualms about going to Finhorn or, or Maui and witnessing to the New Ages. I know what they do, but I know what they need. Easier said than done, but that's it. Interesting, isn't it? That's what Paul did. And to reach people in the new spirituality, that's what we need to do today. We need to take this and say, yeah, wait a minute. You understand about dualism, but you have the wrong view of it. You understand about the relationship between spirituality and sexuality, but you've got a perverted view of it. You understand about man being a god, but you got the wrong view of it. The Mormons, yeah, you understand about baptism, but you got the wrong view of it. Baptism on behalf of the dead. You, you guys, you have prophecies, you have fortune tellers and all this kind of stuff, like Ronald Reagan's wife used to go to Gene Dixon and then tell him how to negotiate with the Soviets. He was the great Christian president of America, married to a witch. Backed by Jerry Farwell, who now calls Reverend Moon an unsung hero. <laughs> on Moon's payroll, apparently. Got money from them. Automatic speech, tongues, the whole bit. <laughs> what it is. I became as all things to all people that I might reach them. To the Jews, to ones under the law, as under the law. Culturally identified with his fellow Hebrews, to those who aren't, as one who isn't. To slaves, I identified with the slaves. To the free, I identified with the free. To the weak, I identified with the weak. To the strong, with the strong. To my fellow Romans, I'm a fellow Roman. To the Greeks, I'm a Greek. He took the word of God and straightened this stuff out. You understand? The problem today is, instead of taking the word of God and straightening the New Ages and the Mormons and so forth out, we're letting them straighten us out. Youth with the mission is telling people go back into the mosques and Hindu temples. Robert Schuller is saying if his grandchildren turn out to be Muslims, he wouldn't be disappointed. He loves the Mufti of, of, of Damascus. He's a great spiritual man. 
He's Bill Hybels, guru. And then Bill, all these bastards are going to Hybels. You understand how this works? <laughs> Instead of going the right direction, they're going the fundamentally opposite direction. Instead of taking the Bible, they're going into experience, into prophecy, into automatic speech. Except that it is a real prophecy and it is a real tongues. Real prophecy and real tongues will agree with Scripture. We won't agree with Rodney Howard Brown. The solution is simple. I don't say the task will be easy. The task will not be easy. But the solution is simple. The strategy is obvious. Just read the New Testament. Read 1 Corinthians. What we should be doing is obvious. But that requires the Word of God. Instead of the Word of God, they're bringing in Tommy Penny, Clark Pinnock, General Coates, and abandoning the Word of God and becoming the same as the New Agers and the Mormons. How pathetic. How sad. And we see the aftermath of this on our tape, Second Corinthians, we talk about it. You know, if you don't love Jesus, you don't love the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you don't love the truth, you don't love the Lord. And Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. At the end of this epistle, verse 22, anathema. And then he says something else, an Aramaic word, mar anatha, maranatha. You see, that's why, despite what Coates says and Tinney says and Pinnock says, I know this is more relevant for today than the day it was written. At least then, the church knew what it had to do. Today, the church is taking what it has to do and what it needs to do and throwing it out the window. It's becoming like the Greek, like the pagan, like the heathen, like the Mormon, like the New Ager. Now, the faithful will realize this and act on it. But I've got to be honest. I don't know if the rest of it can be stopped, short of one thing. The return of Jesus. How does this epistle end? Mar Anatta. What does Maranatha mean? Come, Lord Jesus. God bless.